So you're settling down with the breath. You don't want to think too much about it, just enough to make it comfortable. You don't want to analyze things to the point where you start losing the breath and getting caught up in the analysis. So you ask yourself just some simple questions. Where do you feel the breath right now? Does it feel comfortable? What would make it feel more comfortable? What would make it feel more like something you really do want to settle down with and spend some time? That's pretty much it. As I said before, when you're getting the mind into concentration, so you're trying to develop jhana, the object is not jhana, the object is the breath. It's only when you've settled down with the breath for quite a while that you begin to be in a position where you can step back a little bit to really understand what you're doing. So it does become more of a skill. You begin to see patterns. And one of the patterns you begin to notice is that you really are following what the Buddha called the seven factors for awakening. You're actually developing those factors. Sometimes the list is mistaken to be a description of what awakening is like, but it's not. It's a description of how you get there. Awakening is so much more than these things. And the description of how you get there, of course, is much more useful than the description of what it's going to be like when you get there. So what have you got? You've got mindfulness. In this case, you're focused on the breath, which is body in and of itself. You're trying to be ardent to stay here alert to what's going on, mindful, remembering to stay here, and also remembering what works in order to keep you here. Putting aside, as they, they say, greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, you're with the body in and of itself and not the body in the world, or thinking about issues of the world. Right here with this sensation, the presence of the body right here. That's your frame of reference. Then there's analysis of qualities as you analyze what kind of breathing is good, what kind of breathing is not good, and also looking at qualities in the mind. Is your pressure on the focus of the mind too much, or is it not enough? Are you feeling lax and lazy, or are you feeling overly stimulated? And what can you do to bring things back into balance? Once you've analyzed things, then you put in the effort to bring things into balance. And when you do it right, there's going to be a sense of fullness, refreshment, a rapture. It can come in a weak form, it can come in a strong form. But the refreshment is what allows you to stay here and say, that, oh yes, this really is good. Then after a while the rapture or refreshment has done its work and it begins to fade a little bit, and there's more of a sense of ease, calm. When there's a calm, then the mind can get concentrated. And as it goes through the stages of concentration, finally gets to a point where it feels very equanimous. It's not excited about anything, but it feels okay right here. And okay, not in a small way, but okay in a big way. Everything feels very stable. You feel really at home. Settle down here. Now this kind of analysis is useful not only to Remind yourself of how to get into concentration when things are difficult. And it's interesting that this is one of the lists of qualities in which your discernment does some work before you settle in. In other words, you're not just forcing the mind to settle down or just finding that it naturally settles down on its own. You find that you've got to do a little work to analyze things a bit to see what's good and what's not good, what needs encouraging, what needs cutting away, and then the mind will settle down. But as I said, this is good not only for reminding yourself of how to get into concentration, but these lists of factors are good for other purposes as well. One way in which they're really useful, if you find yourself engaged in some addictive behavior or addictive thinking. You can think of that addiction as kind of like being caught in a bad dream. 
You're caught in a sense that it keeps looping around. Our mind goes through lots of different feedback loops. But if you were to trace the mind as it wanders through the day ordinarily, it goes from one loop to another loop to another one to another one. But certain patterns of behavior are more like getting stuck in a loop and not being able to get out. You do something and you feel bad about it, and then because you feel bad about it, you want to do something to make yourself feel good, and so you go back and you do it again. Because you think that's the only way you're going to get a little hit of pleasure. And it just goes around and around and around and it doesn't come out. What you've got to learn how to do is get out of that loop. And as I said, if you can regard it as a bad dream, what do you do to get out of the dream? Well, you wake up. That's what these factors are for. So say you've got a desire to give in to some lustful thinking, and part of the mind says there's going to be some pleasure there, and you have to recognize, well, that's not a part of the mind you want to hang out with or to believe. Even though there may be some pleasure, the long-term results are not all that positive. So the first thing you do is establish your awareness with the body or with any other frames of reference for mindfulness. But say you're with a body, okay, work with the breath, try to reclaim the breath, because oftentimes these patterns of thinking tend to lay hold of your breath. They come and seize it and make it theirs. They appropriate the breath for their purposes. They make you feel uncomfortable here, uncomfortable there, this part of the body feels tense, that part of the body feels blocked. And part of the committee will say, okay, if, if you give in to our desire, then we'll unblock things. It's like they've held the breath hostage. So you've got to reclaim the breath. Breathe deeply, breathe in a way that feels refreshing, it kind of airs things out inside. And you establish yourself with a frame of reference, so you're not swimming around with these thoughts. You've got at least the breath and the body here. And you're putting yourself in a position where you can watch things. You don't have to get involved. Because the main principle of understanding things going on in the mind is your ability to step back from them and see them as something separate. That's what the image of the Committee of the Mind is useful for, or John Lee's image of all those germs going through your blood, and some of them going through the blood vessels around your, your brain and dropping off a few thoughts as they go past. Or going around other parts of the body, making you feel feelings here and feelings there, sensations here and there that would get you provoked into doing something unskillful. Well, learn to see these things as alien. You don't have to side with them. You don't have to take them on. In the committee, just remember there are some bad members of the committee, and they've been pretty powerful in the past, but they don't have to maintain that power. You can learn how to change the balance of power in the mind. To see them as alien. That deprives them of, of a lot of their strength right there. Once you've got this beachhead with the breath and this position where you can stand with the body in and of itself, that's when you can analyze things. In other words, this urge you have to think these thoughts, what does it feel like? What are the sensations in the different parts of the body? What are the feelings? What are the thought states that go through the mind, instead of just running with them. So you're going to watch them for a bit to see what they're like and take them apart. The Buddha gives lots of different ways of analyzing this. You can look at them as aggregates, the sensations in the body, the feelings of pleasure or pain, the perceptions, the images you hold in mind. What are the images you hold in mind? Not so much about the object you're lusting for, but what images do you have about lust? Why does it seem attractive? What's the glamour? What's the, the appeal? Can you switch those images? Or the way you talk to yourself about it, can you change the, the storyline? So that the narrative you had ends up pretty disastrous, what they call poisoning the fantasy. 
analyze things like this, so you can step back from them and see them as separate, and see exactly what is it that has the pull that keeps you going back again and again and again. So you take the analysis and you apply it. And this is what the persistence part is. As you see, it, you see something is unskillful, okay, take it apart. Don't simply fall in with it. Step back from it, and the, the more you can analyze it into discrete sensations or discrete feelings or discrete thoughts, the less power it has. It's because these things connect up and they create a strong impression, an overwhelming urge to think thoughts that you know are not going to be helpful, or to do things you know are going to be unskillful, are going to lead to trouble down the line. Try to open things up, because all too often when you get focused on something like this, it can be anger or lust or whatever, your awareness narrows down. And then it seems to be surrounded on all sides. And if you can open up your awareness, give it a foundation here in the body, and then take all these different things apart, you see that as they're taken on one by one by one, they don't have that power. It's when they meld together that they are strong and overwhelming. So take them apart, chop them into pieces. And you should keep at this. In the beginning, it's going to be a strain because you've got to work against some very strong tendencies. But there will come a point where you break through and there's a sense of refreshment. You've made it through the other side. And that's what allows the mind to finally get a sense of ease and to get concentrated and be equanimous toward the, the original urge. In other words, not be interested in it anymore. And this is how you wake up. And then you want to remember that, that it felt really good when you finally got past it. That's a good thing to keep in mind. That as we're practicing, we're trying to gather up enough experience so that our mindfulness isn't just informed by what we've heard or about what we've read, but by things that we've done and we've gotten results. And you want to remind yourself of how good the results are, because that's going to change the the tenor of the perceptions in your mind, especially the ones that say, once this urge comes, you've got to give in to it inevitably and there's no other way out. You've already gotten this far down the line with this particular fantasy, so let's just run with it. Well, you've got to learn how to say no. Maybe I've been with it for a certain amount of time, but I don't have to follow it all the way through. I don't have to finish the storyline. I'm not committed. That's interesting that all too often we find it hard to be committed to meditation, but once something unskillful comes into the mind, there's this idea, well, I've already done this much, I've gotten this far, I'm committed to it, I might as well go all the way. So we can cut that storyline, or cut that threat. And then there's the other one that says, you've given in in the past, make it easy on both of us, give in quickly this time, don't struggle and then give in, give in right away. I remind myself the struggle is, is something skillful. John Mahabo talks about this a lot. He says, when, when you give in totally, how can you say that you lost? Because you didn't even put up a fight. If there was a fight, then you can say one side won, the other side lost. But here's, there's no fight at all. Put up some struggle. And when the wife says you're going to give in, say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do in about five minutes' time, but right now I'm not going to give in. And then, of course, five minutes' time, you tell yourself again, I'm, right now I'm not going to give in. Then you can make your determination outlast the urge to give in to your addiction. And then you can strengthen that, as I said, by being with a breath, by having these tools for analyzing things. So that what seems like an overwhelming urge is just broken down into aggregates little bits and pieces of feeling, physical sensations, perceptions, thoughts, consciousness of these things. That's how you get past. That's how you wake up out of these bad dreams.
So try to appreciate the fact that as you're working on getting the mind settled down with the breath, you're getting to know your mind a lot better, and you're developing some skills that you can use in a lot of different situations that you might not expect, but they're there, ready to be put into use. The Buddha taught things that are useful. Sometimes these lists seem kind of dry and foreign, but as you get more and more acquainted with your breath, acquainted with the mind as it settles in, circles around the breath, and finally settles in, you see that the Buddha's descriptions are really accurate, very precise, and very helpful. He worked many aeons to be in the position where he could give that kind of advice, and it's meant to be used. So think of all the trouble he went to to learn these things and pass them on. And make that your sign of gratitude for the Buddha, that you're going to use his teachings and come out with the results.